within five seconds of looking at me, you'll notice that I'm different. And I usually start my talks by talking about the 11 minutes and 54 seconds that led to my trusty steed. Or I'll tell you about how my parents were told by professionals, give up on those hopes. He's not going to reach where you want him to reach. And while all of that is relevant, today I've decided that there is a bigger picture at play. So for now, what I want you to remember is I'm different. A message that was particularly salient to me as a kid. I have vivid memories of crying, asking, why me? Why did I have to be different? Why did I not get to be like the rest of my friends? I couldn't jump rope at a recess. I couldn't run around the track the same way that they did. Although, I will be honest and say, had I been running around the track, I probably would have won. Wheels over feet any day. <laughs> but, but I felt that difference, and I struggled with that feeling of not feeling like I belonged. But as a kid, can we really understand what that's like? I don't think so, and so I did what any human would do. I repressed. And as an adolescent, I continued to repress my differences, even though I started to see that there were a lot of them. How I looked, how I act, who I love, how I think. All of these differences were a part of me, and I couldn't understand why I wasn't like everybody else. So repression worked as well as it could, and then I got to college. And for those of you that haven't guessed already, I was a psych major. And um, <laughs> the, uh, the odds of not talking about identity in classes is pretty slim, at least I would hope. And so I remember sitting in my psych of diversity course, and we started to talk about identity. And I had to really think about my differences and how these privileged and oppressed identities come together to create a person. I view identity as a puzzle. Each piece of you is a piece to create a whole picture. And if that's the case, then you need every piece to complete who you are. It provides perspective, and it allows people to really take in the beauty of, in this case, the human. And I started to go through an internal dialogue. What, what am I? Who am I? How does this play into the work that I do? This was things that I went through at home with my friends, but never really publicly. You see, public Jose was a mental health professional. He did advocacy that focused on data and policy. And identity, context, that wasn't a part of that. That was personal. That couldn't come with me because science doesn't work that way. You can imagine, though, that many of us think that way. That didn't last very long for me, and I'm really lucky. My senior year of, of college, I had an opportunity to speak at a conference. Now, I had done this before, and I thought, OK, great, I'm going to prepare my slides, have my numbers ready to go, and we're going to go in there and make sure everybody hears about disparity. And that's what we're going to do. I was in for a little surprise when I found out, we don't want your data. We want to see what your experience was like. And so Peace Love Studios asked me to share my story as a mental health professional. They asked me to talk about what it was like to be different in the mental health space. And I was terrified. I don't do that. Mental health professionals don't do that. And it was terrifying. But I had already agreed to it. And my mother, who is in the audience today, will tell you that I am stubborn. And so I wasn't about to say that I'm not going to do this. I was doing it, and I was going to figure out a way to do it. And I did, in front of hundreds of people. I talked about how my different experiences uh, give me the opportunity to empathize with people, to understand what it's like to hear, you can't do this, or this space is not made for you. I was able to hear and feel the emotion behind having to learn how to operate in different circles. That was a gift to me as a mental health professional, and telling that story allowed me to recognize that. And that conference, I often will say, freed me, saved my life, changed my life, you name it. 
I am the person I am today because of that experience. It was like a lid was taken out of the, off the box and allowed me to come out, and there was no other way for that lid to go back on. I had to explore this a lot more. I had to explore what it was like to welcome vulnerability and authenticity into the mental health space. So I decided I wanted to keep speaking, maybe not in front of hundreds of people every single time, just to get my feet wet a little bit. And a couple months later, I had the opportunity to speak again. And I spoke at a university. I spoke about the qualities of a good mental health professional, whatever that means. But in my eyes, that meant being real, being honest, being genuine, understanding why you're in that space, why you're serving people. And during that talk, there was a young person in the audience who cried the whole way through. And I remember thinking, why is this person crying? Either I'm doing a really bad job or something's resonating. And I did what I think anyone would do. At the end of the talk, I discreetly went up and said, hey, I noticed you were having a hard time during the talk. How are you? This person began to cry even more. And I thought, you really stepped in it now. <laughs> I don't know what's about to happen. But that person said to me, you're the first person to ask me how I'm doing in a really long time. And I just said, can I hug you? And I hugged this person. And for me, I will carry that with me always. It is a stark reminder that people are just that, people. And people have experiences and journeys and stories that matter that inform who they are in front of you, that person walking down the street that seems to be having a really hard day, you have no idea what the impact a smile can have on that person. What a gift. What a gift we have to connect with people. And so in that moment, with that person, I made a promise to myself that I was going to be a different kind of mental health professional. I was going to be the person who cares about people who wants to hear stories. And so I decided I was going to speak more under my platform, the Phoenix Empowered. The idea that people can rise from the ashes when they're empowered to do so. When we create spaces for people to share their story, we create a beautiful conundrum, a beautiful catastrophe, a beautiful symphony of people coming together to really make meaningful work. And that is what I was seeking out to do. Now, unfortunately, when you're starting to speak, speaking doesn't pay the bills. So I was working full time. And I was working with individuals with disabilities on a college campus. And I really loved it. I loved being able to meet people in various degrees and spectrums of diversity and have these conversations about how we can make it equitable and accessible. That, for me, meant everything. But I soon found that because I was so willing to listen, my students kept coming back and kept having really deep conversations with me. And I started to realize a pretty disturbing trend. I noticed that when sociopolitical events like the Pulse nightclub shooting, El Paso, Las Vegas, vicious, divisive hate crimes happened, people felt it. And the remarkable thing is, you don't have to be part of the event to feel it. At various degrees of separation, you are impacted by this hate. And so I wanted to understand why. And I felt like I needed to go on that journey because this shared identity allowed people to feel pain, allowed people to acknowledge injustice, and to grieve loss, while at the same time providing a space for acceptance, for joy, community, and organizing for collective action. What an amazing feeling to know that there are people like you, people who care. But you see, my students were seeing these hate crimes and seeing themselves and their loved ones reflected on the screen. Something had to be done. So if you've read my bio, you know that I went back to school and I'm in my first year of a PhD program. Thank you. 
although the bags are proof that I need to work on sleeping. I know, I know, I'm working on it. But I have a particular interest in trauma, and trauma within minoritized identities, like ethnicity, ability, and sexuality. I want to understand why things move the way they do, why we feel things from across the globe when there's no theory or framework or explanation for it. Why are we all so connected through this shared identity? And what are we doing about it? You see, mental health is a global, complex problem that requires a global and complex solution. The one-size-fits-all kind of approach will no longer be acceptable. It doesn't work. People have different experiences. And when we honor people, that's when we really make that difference. That's when we make that connection. That's what mental health work is. You see, 11 minutes and 54 seconds changed my life. But it didn't define my life. And it doesn't define who I'm going to be. In fact, it gives me the gift to decide how I'm going to use my difference to connect with every single person in this room. Imagine that. Imagine connecting with the person next to you, with a stranger down the street, because you're different and you know what it feels like. So if you'll humor me for a second, I'd like to try something here. If you would, just raise your hand if you've ever felt different. No matter how high, no matter how low, and then look around you, because difference is everywhere. We're all different. That's the beauty. But yet we get to share a human experience of joy, pain, sorrow, and empowerment. We get to be together in this space. We have to do something about that. And so I'm going to leave you today with three promises that I know I can make. The first one is, I see you, even when you don't feel seen. I hear you, even when you don't feel heard. And I will work my hardest to make sure that your identities are honored. Thank you.